The conservation of energy equation and the Bernoulli's equation are two of the most complicated and messy looking equations in physics on the MCAT. In this video, we're going to break them down to just two variables each and talk about the similarities that we can see in the mechanical conservation of energies and the fluid-based Bernoulli's equation. Let's get started. The conservation of energy equation is based on a foundational principle of physics which says that for a given system, energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transferred. The conservation of energy equation relies on mechanical energy, which can be split into kinetic energy, when an object is moving, has a velocity, and potential energy, when the object has a height or a potential to move but is not moving yet. Let's look at a common example of conservation of energy with a ball rolling down a hill. Okay, so here we have a situation where a ball starts at rest, the top of a hill, rolls down a hill, and then reaches a final velocity. Now, there are a few assumptions we can make with the conservation of energy on the MCAT. The first is that the object will always start at rest at its initial phase. So when we say initial, we're really meaning at rest. When we're at rest, what is our velocity? Our velocity should be zero. Initial velocity should be zero, which means that our first part of our conservation of energy equation, one half mv squared, m meaning mass, and v meaning velocity, is going to equal zero because our initial velocity is zero. Now this is our initial kinetic energy. One half mv squared is our kinetic energy equation. So what we're saying here is our assumption of our object being at rest means that our whole initial kinetic energy variable is equal to zero, which means we can get rid of it as part of our equation. Now we have the mass times gravity times the height, the initial height of this object, which is compared to our final height of our object. All right, so our object is now starting at rest and now it's going to go ahead and move and our ball is gonna roll down the hill. And as it rolls down the hill, it's going to be gaining velocity, right? It's gonna be increasing in kinetic energy, decreasing in potential energy. Then as it goes back up the hill, right? It's going to slow down, lose velocity, and gain height, potential energy. And then eventually it's going to reach its final state. Now our final state is arbitrary. It's whatever the question says um, is our final state. And what we can see in the equation is we didn't really care about all this middle part, right? We don't have part of the equation that says halfway through the process. We only have our final kinetic energy and our final potential energy. So at this point, we can say, all right, whatever this height is, this height is our final height, and we can set it to zero. Why? Because we don't care if it's going up or down past this point. This is our final height compared to our initial height, and we don't really care about the path that it took to get there because our equation only includes our final height variable. So as long as this object is kind of in its final state, we can set our height to zero, our final height to zero. And this is true for any conservation of energy equation. So if our final height is set to zero because of our system, right, we're just getting to our final height, we can set our entire final potential energy to zero, which means we can remove it from the equation. All right, so now we're left with initial potential energy, right, this is our potential energy variable, equals our final kinetic energy. And this makes sense conceptually, right? If we're starting at rest, we're at our maximum possible potential energy, and then we get to our final state, we're at our maximum final kinetic energy. So we're trading potential energy for kinetic energy in this situation. So we now have our equation, I'm gonna rewrite it here, mgh initial equals one half mv squared final. Now, what's on both sides of the equation? We have mass, and the mass of the object is going to stay the same, right? Our object is what's moving, it's going to stay the same mass initial as it is final. And when you have the same variable on both sides of the equation, guess what you can do? You can cancel it out. So we can cancel out our masses here. So now check out our final equation. I'm going to write it big over here. Gravity times initial height equals one half velocity squared final, our final velocity. Now gravity is a constant 9.8, right? 9.8 meters per second squared. On the MCAT, we can always round that to 10 meters per second squared, right? Because we don't have a calculator, so we can round that up a bit. So this is a constant. So check it out. We really only have two variables to deal with here. We have our initial height and our final velocity. 
So on the MCAT, with just two variables, they'll give us one and ask us for the other. So they could give us initial height, they say the object starts at 10 meters, and ask us for our final velocity once it reaches the bottom of the hill. Or they can ask us for the initial height given a final velocity. Say, hey, our object is moving 10 meters per second. How high did it start from at rest? Let's do a practice question together. Let's say that our initial height was 5 meters. And I want to know the final velocity. Using our equation that we've derived below, go ahead and try this question on your own. Pause this video, and then we'll work through it together. Okay, so I've gone ahead and rearranged the equation here to solve for final velocity. You can always plug in the numbers first and then rearrange. It is up to you and how you like to do the math. I rearranged the equation first and then I'm going to plug in our numbers. So square root of 2 times 10 for gravity times 5 for our initial height is going to give us our final velocity. 2 times 5 is 10 times 10 is 100. So what is the square root of 100? That's just going to be 10. 10 meters per second is going to equal our final velocity with an initial height of 5 meters. We can also double check with our units here. Gravity is meters per second squared, and then height is just meters. So we have meters squared per second squared, but we're taking the square root of those values. So we're going to get rid of the exponent and end up with just meters per second, which is our velocity value. We've set up the numbers correctly. All right, we've simplified the conservation of energy equation. Before we get into the more complicated Bernoulli's equation, I'm Amanda Brem, and I've been coaching pre-meds on their MCAT journeys since 2019. Please remember to subscribe to this channel for more videos on MCAT content, test-taking strategies, and mental fitness tips that'll help you perform your best on test day. And if you'd like more interactive lessons on topics like these, including test-taking strategies and study planning skills, go ahead and check out our next available MCAT course using the link in the caption below. All right, let's deal with this mess of an equation known as the Bernoulli's equation. We're going to start by breaking down each component of this equation and then do a very similar derivation to what we just did for conservation of energy. Let's start with the very first variable, atmospheric pressure, or P1 and P2. So this is the atmospheric pressure outside of the fluid of interest at the beginning, at the initial phase of our process, and at the end of our process. Now on the MCAT, I can tell you, this is almost always going to be the same pressures on either side. It's either going to be open to the atmosphere, like our tank here, um, meaning we'll have the same pressure at the beginning as at the end, or it's going to be in our body systems, which have a consistent pressure, atmospheric pressure. So we can go ahead and eliminate these two variables because they're usually the same on both sides. Now our next variable looks awful similar to the kinetic energy variable in our conservation of energy equation, right? 1 half rho v squared, very similar to 1 half mv squared initial, right? So the only difference here is the rho. The rho is referring to density. The density of a fluid is mass over volume. So really, this is just saying the kinetic energy per unit volume of the fluid. So here, you can really see what the Bernoulli's equation is describing. It's saying, hey, this is conservation of energy, but for fluids. And in fluids, we don't just care about the mass, we care about the space that the fluid takes up. So we have to include a volume measurement. So let's check out our next variable here, which of course looks very similar to our potential energy, rho gh instead of mgh, so it's just mgh per unit volume. Again, same concept of potential energy. Now, you may also recognize rho gh as being hydrostatic pressure. It is in fact the hydrostatic pressure equation, rho gh. So in the world of fluids, when we're talking about potential energy, we're really talking about hydrostatic pressure or the amount of pressure that a fluid puts on an object given a certain height or depth of that fluid. On the other side of things, the kinetic energy is the fluid dynamics. When the fluid is flowing, it's moving forward flow. So that kinetic energy variable in Bernoulli's is talking about the forward flow, the dynamic movement of the fluid, and we're comparing that to our hydrostatic pressure of our fluid. So as we have more forward flow, we have less hydrostatic pressure. Because again, this is an equilibrium with our final forward flow. I'm going to go ahead and call this hydrostatic pressure and forward flow. Now these are 
kind of loose interpretations here, but they help us visualize what's happening with these two variables. So we're going to be having less pressure on the vessel walls or vertical depth pressure and more forward flow. Uh, conversely, if we have a greater hydrostatic pressure, we'll have less flow, less forward flow moving through the vessel or through the object. So now let's do a basic example with our water tank here. So we have our initial fluid. It's going to be this little kind of volume of fluid up at the top here of the tank. And if you've ever watched a water tank at the very top, our velocity here is zero because our initial velocity, this fluid isn't moving anywhere, right? It's just hanging out in the tank. It doesn't have any forward flow or velocity. So just like our conservation of energy equation, our initial velocity here can be zero, which means we can eliminate this whole initial um, rho v squared equation. Now we have a vertical height right between the initial and the final and we want to be very careful that the height is the height of the fluid right the height of the water not the height of the tank. So our height here right this will be our initial height and then we have our final height here where the water is flowing out and we can of course still set that to zero right at that point we don't care about how much higher or lower the fluid goes this is our final height so we're going to set that to zero so similarly just like we did with conservation of energy we can eliminate our final hydrostatic pressure equation because that's going to be zero in this setting right the height will be zero making this whole value zero so now just like we did before check it out we have uh, rho g h initial equals one half rho v squared final. Now our densities of our fluid, this is the same fluid, so it has the same density. So we can eliminate that and check it out. Same exact equation as our conservation of energy equation. Initial height times gravity equals one half final velocity squared. So if we were asked to calculate Bernoulli's law, given like a tank setup where our initial velocity is zero and we have an initial height and a final height and a final velocity, you can just simplify down to use just this equation. You don't have to deal with this whole messiness up here. It's redundant. We have parts we can eliminate. You can go straight to solving for velocity or for height here. Now conceptually in a blood vessel, just note that if we're talking about a blood vessel, if we have a bigger blood vessel, it has a bigger area, that's a bigger vertical height, all right? So that's going to be a higher hydrostatic pressure, which means, relatively speaking, according to Bernoulli's equation, we're going to have less of that one-half rho v squared equation, right? We're going to have less forward flow. But as the vessel gets smaller, we're going to have less hydrostatic pressure and relatively more forward flow. All right, so we're going to flow through faster in a smaller part of the vessel and slower through a bigger part of the vessel. This can also be described by an equation known as the continuity equation. Uh, cross-sectional area 1 times velocity 1 equals cross-sectional area 2 times velocity 2, where the bigger the area, the smaller the velocity in a given consistent vessel. We'll talk more about continuity equation and Venturi effect in a future video. For now, I want you to see how our Bernoulli's equation is just conservation of energy, but for fluids. All right, I hope this video cleared up some confusion on those chunky and complicated physics equations on the MCAT. If this video helped you, please share it with your pre-med community. The MCAT can be a lot to study for, and sometimes we all need a little help. Thanks so much. I'll see you in the next video, and as always, happy studying.